Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Sandra Singh Lo to our screen to talk about the writing life and her new book, The Mad Woman and the Roomba, My Year of Domestic Mayhem. Sandra is a writer and a performer. Her work has been heard on NPR's Morning Edition and This American Life. She's a contributing editor to The Atlantic and hosts the daily podcast, The Lowdown on Science. Interviewing her is her friend, actress and comedian, Julia Sweeney. So ladies, why don't Hello. we get started? I, we'd love to hear um, how you guys know each other and how you've become friends. It's, it seems like so long ago, even like three I know it. How did, when like did we not 40 know years either? ago. I mean, I think it was like back in the Tiffany, when there was a Tiffany theater. Oh, that's right, the and, Tiffany theater, right. Yeah, you know, Fryer, my partner, worked with you on all your shows that were right. happening. Like God said, ha, went yeah. to Broadway, he knew of you. I was doing anything bad sex with my when did I see you first? I must have been at the Tiffany or at the Geffen. I'm yeah, sure. I, think, I think maybe 1998, which is like, how long ago? Is it 20 years ago? <gasps> yes. So, yeah. It's so funny. I thought it was even longer ago. I feel like I knew you from even before then. But anyway. But, and, but I think there was all, also, even though you were on the Saturday Night Live level and the Broadway level, you were also doing at the time, I think, is like, like a, a KCRW, it was called First World Problem. Oh, yeah. I only did that like four times. <laughs> I couldn't keep it up. I can't do, I can't be you. You keep it up. I'm a good starter of things and then I just drop the ball. Um, no, you're always working. So there was a connection between the yes. comedy and the writing and all yeah. of that. Well, I've been such a big fan of yours, Sandra. Oh. I've seen your shows. I love watching you on stage and I love your writing, especially. I love it, love it. You're really so gifted and I love your essays and I feel so lucky that I get to be your friend. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so lucky that we get to Zoom during the pandemic. I with know it. Hair. I just washed my hair for the first time. Too. I think it even looks worse than it did before. No, it looks good. You think so? I, or I can I do the say, hat. I have to say your whole look is great. Okay. <laughs> I love the hat. Okay. And can well, I show you? I have you... to have a hat right by my computer at all times in case. Can I show you the one other thing? Because this, yes. this is my book. So I am wearing what I call not my fat pants. There's nothing <laughs> no such thing as fat pants or just our pants. It is, you know, my thing is kind of like, I'm not turning 50, 12, 14 years old. I'm becoming a goddess or I haven't gained 20 pounds in the pandemic. I have become more goddess like. So these are my great goddess pants. I'm going to send you some. Uh, see? Oh. Kind of like a Bollywood elastic. Oh, interesting. Oh. So, and they're unisex, so I'll send you and Michael some. Um, Mulan <laughs> probably will turn up her nose, but. Okay, but wait, I have this thing where I've also gained a lot of weight and I'm totally in acceptance and I'm, I have no plans to lose it. <laughs> um, and, um, but I still like the tight fitting clothes. Really? I have a weird, I, I'm like, I have an almost autistic response to clothes. Like I want the structure of the clothes, but it's difficult with my body getting larger and larger because as you might know, then the clothes must be larger and larger. <laughs> anyway, so what? So we're here. I mean, but I think as for our last Zoom conversation, and I know we'll get to my book eventually, but I've just been- No, we've got to go there right now. Okay, go well, ahead. We'll, go, well, well, two things, I guess. It's kind of like when we Zoomed the last time of the pandemic, you were really getting into the quarantine. I still the, am, actually. The tragedy. Now I have fears. Now you have fears, okay. But how are you doing? Like, because you, you were having a harder time than me, but you were still using it. I mean, you were uh, doing- I, I think it's been, um, I, I think what I realized, and as per my book, The Mad Woman in the Room, it seems so ridiculous at this time to be putting out a book that is just really, you know, a year of domestic mayhem of really our daily lives, like the Knausgaard, except right. that from Pasadena and a woman's writing it so we don't get to be Knaus Guardian. I'm just looking at those little um, moments that are yes. our daily lives. Like when you go to the farmer's market and have that uptick of buying the, you can't find basil because it's not in season, so you buy kohlrabi, you don't know why, you don't know what to do with it. Seems similar. Um, <laughs> um, and then no, you but I love that. Well, it is interesting because your book is so, because without realizing it, it's kind of become this microcosm of life before. 
you know. Um, and I wondered if, because I just, the last two days I've been rereading it. I read it, when, when did I read it? A year ago or six months ago or something? And you know I love it so much and I love it even more. Um, but it's, I just love following your daily life and your small things and the frustrations. And I love how you, uh, we just get this little window. It's really like a camera. You're such a good writer and such a good um, descriptive person. We get just a little, the curtains open a little and then they close again. And then it's this other part of your life. They open, then they close. And, <laughs> but it is true that it is all life before this. And also such unknown of what's going to happen. We don't really know what's happening, you know, what the world's going to be like in a year. But my feeling though is, is that really I do mean this, the book is so good. It doesn't matter about the world changing. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's, gonna, it's okay because it's, I feel like you could be writing another book about this. I mean, like, well, I, I've always been, and I, I throw the I Ching a lot, almost <laughs> almost meaninglessly at this point. And there's a, a hexagram called the preponderance of the small. And I do think that many of our daily lives are just put yeah. together with these small moments that we don't read about in the newspapers as, you know, uh, kind of media becomes more and more centralized. It's kind of like right. war, politics. Blah, but there's so many small moments that that make up the texture of our lives. I've always been really fascinated by that. In the old Herald Examiner that no one remembers in Los Angeles, there was the Sunday magazine was called Home Magazine, and there was a column called Things by Mib Shave. Thing. <laughs> and, like, and, I, like, and I remember reading it as a teenager, kind of like, oh, the leaky faucet. What does that mean? Right. Well, on NPR, they used to have, you know, what, Bailey White was the commentator. And there would be always somebody at five minutes before the hour talking about, like, baseball cards and the leaves falling. And that's, I was always a sucker for this slight essay of something that happens there. But I'm noticing. But you've become a master at it, really. <laughs> it's very inspiring. I, I have to say, you really. There were so many sentences I wrote down. Just your descriptions are really, really precise and unusual and perceptive. Well, uh, thank you. I'm um, a fan. <laughs> hopefully people will go back to reading now. Um, but I think I, I also noticed some of the things that I used to complain about. I'm just looking at my hat, like, welcome, fly with us. Like, like a bad Fosse number, you know, kind of like, fly with us, etc. You no, know, you do seem like you should start tap dancing. Yeah, kind of like a jazz hands thing. Um, you know, even going to the gym when in the pandemic. Now, you've been doing better than me um, because I realize as a sedentary writer how much of my week was set up with the t two tent poles of these 830 spinning classes. Oh, yeah. Lux. And it wasn't because I'm a good athlete. It's just kind of like the excitement of getting the bike and the titanium water bottles. Right. Everybody's like middle-aged. and Actually, you made me want to do spinning again. <laughs> yeah. Because <do this>, <laughs> her name is Riel and she dances on the set. It's like middle-aged people doing it. But did you spin? But you are a good Yes. Um. No, I, weirdly, I have a body that would be a before picture in any magazine in the world. <laughs> and yet I do an enormous amount of exercise to keep myself at this look. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so I used to hike. I used to do stuff every day. But anyway, now I have, I have a pool. I know. I feel like it's so red. <laughs> and um, no, but now I go in twice a day and do 30 minutes of jazzercise dancing in the pool underwater. Oh. And it's fun. You'll have to come over and do it because Michael looked up and even on the CDC website, which I know is not reliable, um, it says the pool will kill the virus. So you can come over and swim. Oh, that's amazing. The chlorine. Okay. Fantastic. I've been doing that, but I used to go to spin. I love yoga class. I'm totally into the yin yoga. I love, love, love the, the slower and less pressure of a class, the better. So I love how you write about that. <laughs> and I love like, that so much. But I also like the spin, but you know what? I never felt that much pressure in spin. I just felt like I'm doing what I'm doing and other people, and they'd say, turn it up. And I would think, well, I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's one good thing about getting older is that, um, people like when I was 35 or 40 going to exercise classes every the teachers were always trying to include me in the class <laughs> maybe because I signed up for the class and I was in the class um but then I got to be the certain age 
And then it was like, oh, that's that lady who just does what she wants in the corner. <laughs> like, yes, that's right. Right. I'm the lady who does what she wants. Yeah, no, it's great. When I remember in ballet class when I was a teen, there used to be the eight-year-old lady who came with a huge flower on the head just in the corner and doing whatever <laughs> the hell she wanted. And that's kind of where we're becoming now. I know. Um, See? Um, it good to get older. Anyway. I know. I, I think that it is freedom. And I think I, you know, cause also kind of in, in writing this book, we've talked about it a bit that I really, um, these lives of women's lives, of, you know, even right. though you know, a majority of women are between like 45 and 65, it's a giant, it's like a 40 million women demographic. Oh, wow. This age. And so, you know, and uh, as with Mad Woman of the Vulva, over half of all American women are 45 and up, over half, wow. the majority. But when you look now, you are actually working totally a lot. Well, you were working before the quarantine came down, but usually it's kind of like you see JLo is 50. And then she plays a 40 year old and then you have Jane Fonda who's 82. So there is a whole, you know, section of right. women's lives that aren't talked about, but there's so much is happening. Yes. So I much. Love, is like I love the chapter about women living alone or being post cohabitation. <laughs> it's so great. But like the whole, um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole group of us who are managing our way or accepting what life was for us and is for us and figuring out if we want to be living with someone or not, for example. I read that, I read that chapter with great interest. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> well, but also things have changed because women, if you, they have their own money, like divorce is really being driven more by, by women than men at yes. a certain age. And it's like, and there, there used to be the being killed by a terrorist is uh, more likely than getting a husband. Like that has been totally debunked. That, that whole question, even that whole framing of that is, is like, you want to get a husband. I mean, like, it's, it's all, it's all the, under this assumption that you would like to be living with someone as a partner, which I am. And actually I ha I'm lucky because I really like my partner, <laughs> but I have my fantasies of living alone. Of course, everyone yes. does. I fantasize yeah. about it. It's heavy fantasy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I so what, all of my fantasies. What does are your mostly about living alone? <laughs> what does your fantasy look like, Julie? Oh, okay. The okay. bedroom. Okay, go one ahead. thing: condo. I would have a condo so that I don't have to deal with a house because to me, a house is like another child. Every, something's going wrong every minute, <laughs> and. Also, because you have to have people coming, so I have to have, this sounds, this is very first world problems, but you know, you have the pool guy, every year something breaks with the pool that's so expensive, you want to take the pool out, but that's more expensive. <laughs> um, the, there's the, the all grass, there's everything, and then the house is just constantly breaking down, and then for us, because we were going to do a remodel, and I guess we still are, if you can, as everything broke in the house, we just threw it out and didn't replace it. So when the garbage disposal broke, we just put it in the garbage can. And then when the dishwasher broke, we just put it on the parking strip. And now the whole house is falling apart, but we haven't done the remodel. So, <laughs> right. Yes. And, and they don't tell us that. And I think that is kind of like in, in okay. kind of like my section in the my book, my yes. house of kind of like, I bought this house. It, it's beautiful. Okay, first of all, like, it's a crazy. How you describe your house? Your house is so much more beautiful than how you describe it. Well, your house is really beautiful. It is beautiful, but I don't think we've made it more beautiful. I mean, I have like an old chair from Sugar Plum Fair. Like it's like it's there. I just put the blanket over to cover bills that were on the couch, and we don't <laughs> maintain it. So okay, and it's gotten so bad now that but you know what? your house is so beautiful, you don't need to maintain it. Right, except, except, the, the, except the lawn. Within. Except the lawn, because we had a gardener come, and all he would do is blow dead leaves around everywhere. What about your gardener who does his blowing at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday? <laughs> right. And then my favorite <laughs> sentence was, you say, it took two years to fire him after you decided to fire him. Because I would pay him to stop. But now it's so bad, other people, are our, our, our neighbor comes and mows our lawn. Oh, my God, us. that's my favorite thing. When your neighbor comes over with the thing going, well, it'll just take five minutes. <laughs> Because we and are, you don't even have time to tell him about not cutting the flowers down. He does it anyway, and then you realize the mosquitoes. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. It's kind of like me and my partner named Charlie in the book. We're kind of you know bohemians. We're aging bohemians. So when you were twenty five, you had a futon. The cat peed on it. So you just threw a blanket over it and had a candle. 
And so now you get to like approaching 60 and you just really never learn these life skills. Like I go to my ex-husband's house and I notice how beautifully he does everything. He's one of those in the apocalypse, people are either like farmers or they're warriors or they're slackers or they're manic depressive busy bees. I call them like the four things. And my ex-husband is a farmer. He's just patiently Swiss chard and he's repainting a shed and he's like, you know, baking his own bread. And I think Michael is like that. Like well, I was just going to say, we're a hybrid of that. I'm a neat person, except in my office. Everywhere else, because you can see, if I'll just show you. <laughs> <laughs> but it is in boxes. Yeah. Um, so in my office, it's not good, but my goal of the quarantine is to get it better. But so I, I make the bed every morning. I pick up the house all the time. But Michael, first of all, Michael has to sleep 14 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. So he's in bed. And like when you were saying the thing about, see, this is a new thing for me. I didn't know about people who woke up and then they're fully awake and yet choose to spend three or four more hours in bed. <laughs> that would be, like yeah. The day has begun for them. And in their mind, the day is going. Yeah. They just happen to still be in bed. Yeah. And my partner, yeah, reads the newspaper, could read it three hours a day. You like to write, like you were saying, you write in bed, you really, you eat in bed. <laughs> For a while I was doing that. Yeah, and I wanted my car to be shaped like a bed. Yeah, it's like I do everything in bed. But now, see, since the pandemic, it's like, now I sort of have to move from room to room because the walls are closing in. Oh, like, I know. Well, that's very important. Well, just think if we were in New York and we had a studio apartment with someone. I don't um, know how to do it. I mean, yeah. because we have the yard. I mean, like we can get away from each other. Michael has an office and I have an office and they, the off stores can close. And our daughter Mulan is here, but she has a bedroom where the door can close. And I would say we spend more than half of our waking hours with a door closed from each other. That sounds dreamy that's yeah, no and it's all it's all you all three of us are good with that yeah but we're quarantining in a 2600 square foot house two of us because my kids are at their dad's and i go see them once a week with expensive takeout and we're some still in each other's way in the bedroom and um and i, I just remember realizing now when i would go to the gym how the ritual of the gym, even the pumping of the Kiehl's products that they have at, right. you know, it's, very, you know, it's its own kind of cardio, flappy arm, like pumping. And then the steam room, the peril of the steam room, like don't slip, don't let your towel fall open. You know, it's kind of like that was very stimulated, getting the right parking, that not having those, just those small little uh, competitive things just really has taken the the wind out of my day oh okay see i feel a little the opposite i think because i feel like now i never want to leave my house <laughs> because i my mind really has gotten quiet in this way like i like where i'm in my head like my head is a very interesting place right now for me i mean that's maybe it won't stay that way but it is right now and i don't want to interact with others what the whole quarantine has made me realize that i really could go there <laughs> Yeah, and I always thought because of your Catholic, <laughs> your Catholic upbringing that you could be a really great nun. Oh, yeah. No, and I liken it to, I feel like I'm in the trouble with angels, and at the end, I've decided to be the nun, and now I'm the nun. <laughs> and now, and I just think, and I know I have fantasies of going, oh, like, I fantasize other people talking about me, saying, you know, after the quarantine, she never did leave her house again. <laughs> I think also though you have projects that work. I think that you've done a little bit of gardening. Like I have tried to garden and it just is kind of like, if your garden shows the love that you feel, my garden shows the hatred that I feel no. for plants because I had this arugula and then yeah. it, when the it's it brought out, to see, you know, it, it goes like that. And then it yeah, gets No, you off. have to be on it. It takes, it's a lot, you can't leave it. It's like having a child. It's like having a two year old. Yeah. You can't, you got to be out there every day and you got to look at it. Like we have our grapefruit tree and Michael has to change the pH of the soil and we look. Oh at my God. Like, yeah, no, it's a whole thing. Oh my God. Cause I actually ran over my plants cause I can't turn over my car. So I just like, <laughs> so it's like, but you guys, I think the pH of the soil, I mean, you're thriving. You're, you're a pot. No, we're good. Michael's doing, he, well, Michael is very, 
he's i mean he's has, has he has a sedentary personality but he spends many hours with the paper and the crosswords and everything like you he does a crossword every day i love that you were saying it was a two what was the thing where it was a tuesday, tuesday. I did the whole crossword in three minutes it didn't even yeah it's unfortunate then you're one <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny um and then but then every day i would say for two or three hours he does something like the gardening or fixes something or put something together or something. And then now, you know what we're into now? Because now, because there aren't planes in the sky at night, we're looking at the stars. So last night, Michael got a picture of Jupiter and the four moons of Jupiter, all of them, all of it. It's like from our backyard in LA. Okay, yeah. that's the, okay, so the contrast between our households is extreme. Is I, did a little, I did a little visual, and I don't know if this will show up, but okay. So this is, so Friar, who's Charlie in the book, yes. and I, we're this bohemian couple. I've slipped into this, he's grown a pandemic depression beard that makes him look like a deranged Confederate war reenactor. Because he's a redhead, but his hair is turned white. So he's got one of those beards that is I know, but like, I what? like it. I what? like okay. it. So this is us before. Okay, it's a glamour shot. It's a Getty shot. Oh, beautiful. Somewhere. Okay, with the with the watermark on it, but it's a Getty. Okay. And this is us now. He's <laughs> <laughs> like some horrible burning man. It's the Crocs. I, I got love the that you have the same pants. Wearing the goddess pants. Now he's wearing the goddess pants. Look at that beard. I mean, it's like, you know, it's. No, I. Okay, I'm yes for the beard. I, I yeah, and, and I, I that you said that the other day while he was here. That was like, yeah. Not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay, now Sandra, how do you? Are you just constantly writing? things about your life that are happening like how do you collect a book like this like it just seems so like your diary do you, and so are you doing that now like I hope you're doing that now because yes. there's so, so much it's, happening it it's, seems like it, it's sort of an interesting journey because um you know so for 19 years in LA first in KCRW and KPCC I had the low life every yes I love like the low life years of weekly writing right now in KPCC, it's just the lowdown on science, which is also actually on Google I News. Like so that. that that has the, so that uh, is great, and I think now more than ever we need the science to be accurate, right. and we need yes. America to be more literate about science, and and so that's the great thing about that. America failed science. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so yeah, that hopefully is the silver lining uh, of that. You know, that now America instead of global warming or climate change was a big issue before but it was a little bit politicized not you know unfortunately right. but everybody wants the coronavirus to be done so that's been yes. the silver lining part of it um yeah. but then i um so and then i started we i started this podcast as you know that you were on it the sleepless in los angeles my first and, and it was so hilarious and I can't listen to it. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> it was going to be the theme of like a monthly magazine. And the first one, of course, hilariously, as you remember, was January New Year's irresolutions. And I had just read. So, yes. So actually, I'm deploying the question to what we've been doing. Um, so I had read that you wrote this blog turning 60 last fall and that you were going to give yourself the gift of never going on a diet again. So Except for two I guess, weeks in January. I, I, <laughs> and I got so excited that I got Popeye's fried chicken, all this cheese oh and baguettes, and arrive at your house. And I'm fasting. <laughs> I've started to fast. And you know what? I totally wouldn't have. I would have broken it and not said anything about it, except that my husband was doing it with me, so I couldn't fake it. Right. And so you are both, and, and as he might sleep 14 hours a day, and he's even weaker, like you said, like when he's fasting, he just like, I'm done. I'm dying. Oh yeah, he lays down like this, like he's dead. <laughs> he's down like this. He has this thing, he, he's one of those people who rest their hands like that. And that's a, that's a thing for him, like he kind of, like if he's thinking. Like the Shavasana. Like this, he, it's, it's <clears throat> and when he goes, he lays down, like I will walk in the living room, and there's a guy like that, with a like dead 
So, so <laughs> tell me, I never got, and, and then I started doing it month by month. And then the third month was going to be a post Mardi Gras with Phil Rosenthal of Netflix. And we went to this crab queens where they have daiquiri seafood and daiquiris made of Everclear. And then the coronavirus hit and everything just seemed so thematically bizarre. But I was going to no, come back. I mean, I, yeah, you got to stop. I mean, uh, like. Yeah, I was going to come back to you, though, and ask how that fast ended up going in January. I did it for five hard. days. I did, did a five-day five fast. I, w I wanted to do seven days, but I couldn't stand it after five. And then... Um, and this I, was like coffee. You could have coffee and water. Yeah, coffee in the morning. And if you really needed to, you could have half an avocado at night. Oh, boy. Yeah. Jesus. And you know what? I do by the science of it. You know, your body wants to go through periods of fasting. It's a part of how we evolved and all these wonderful things happen in your body. All your cells rejuvenate and repair themselves and do all these things. But then that was it. That was after that was over. I thought I'll never do this again. <laughs> and, um, actually, the happiest thing in my life right now is not dieting or letting myself be heavy. And have it be okay as long I feel like I'm exercising and I, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm just letting myself be who I am. And then I got this part on American Gods. Um, and then I don't want to talk about me, but I got this part of it on American Gods where I was supposed to be heavier than I am. So they padded me, not with real padding, but I wore like three or four sweaters in every scene. And I really looked big. I mean, like I, <laughs> I was big. I mean, you know, like big in space. And then I loved it. I like it. It felt good. <sighs> And then I was like, why need, Why do I have to have the sweaters? <laughs> why well, can't I just have my own sweaters? I, no, I think there's a, that whole journey of us as like women. I remember I've always been such an awkward dresser in my 20s that I sort of always wanted to be an Emersonian eye that was just like this, this mind that flew around Is without having happening? to bother with any, I mean, look at without having to bother with any of this, you know, the stuff. Um, so I think... <clears throat> Right, patting yourself and being comfortable with that, in a way that's kind of what we're doing in quarantine also, where you're really only seen from here up. Sometimes people don't even wear pants. So that's been kind of a freeing great. in a way. It is. Although we have to look at ourselves and like do, so I got these glasses off of Zenny that are supposed to be anti-reflective, but I don't know. Oh yeah, that's what I got. These are my computer glasses. Right. And then I did my tableau and I feel like you only see me from here up. I'm Soon I'll be 300 pounds. <laughs> Um, but it won't matter. No one will know. Um, <laughs> um, wait, Sandra. Okay, can I just tell you? Because there's some things I just want to tell you about what I love about your book. Okay, first of all, what about your book about Thanksgiving and sitting outside your old house, looking at your old house? That really yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> so I had famously, <clears throat> thank you for asking that, like, in The Mad Woman of the Volvo, I at 46 became paramenopausal. I had been a public school mom and rented RVs to protest budget cuts at Sacramento. And a bunch of us were early 40s. Our kids were kind of September 11th kids, so they were all the same age. And then once learning to drive an RV, I go, I'm going to go with my sisters to Burning Man. And so, and Charlie, my partner would come along and he, we were both married to other people. And then we had this Burning Man moment of just like kind of going, oh, you're the one that I love after 10 years, this merchant ivory thing. So I blew up my marriage sort of oh, wow. awfully, awfully, sort of publicly um, because I had had an affair and everybody kind of knew that because I was yeah. writing in the Atlantic about it. So, so I think for a while though, Due to you know what you're saying about the fantasy of being single, in a way, women start realizing 45 and up if they can make some of their own yeah. money. What is the advantage of staying in these companionate marriages? Just because the kids are all gifted, they're all gifted. So, um, <clears throat> so right. you know the kids' disrupt schedule can't be disrupted, even if the parents have both twin laptops open at night with their Merlot or whatever, watching different shows and living these kind of parallel track lives. Right. But I think for a while, then I was writing about when I was a single, well, my, my musician husband would go on tour a lot, uh, like half the year. So I'd be home in my bed 
writing right. and my kids would be there all the time and have no child care would like throw Halloween candy at them or <laughs> just be like, keep watching TV keep watching TV but uh, after the they, they round the horn of noon uh, they don't want to watch TV anymore unfortunately I've learned that so I had talked a lot about though then when I was divorced how it was great because I was like the divorced dad so when they would come over we would make lemonade and my kids always wanted to make lemonade um, and we never did because it was so messy and sticky. And so now that I was the divorced non-custodial parent, we would do all these fantastic things. We'd go to county fairs, we would bowl. I hate right. bowling, all this kind of stuff. But then as you're saying with the Thanksgiving thing, as time passes, you know, they were six and eight when I got divorced. Now they're uh, 17 and 19, 18 and 19. <clears throat> then you just realize it's, it's just time. It's just, I've missed half their lives. And, right. and, and, and it's kind of like part of the sequence of this journey of a year. And I think right. Thanksgiving, and I can't even imagine what Thanksgiving is going to be like this year, but it's kind of a very beautiful and sad time. I know. I'm thinking about that too. Um, okay, wait, there's so many. Oh my God, do you still have the Costco massage chair? It's right here. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> I can't tell you how hard it was for me not to figure out. I was already thinking in my house where it would go. See, and so here's the clicker, and it goes up and down. It's right here. It's in the center of the room. Because I'm like you about the massage. Like, oh. I, in fact, I, so I, I signed up for Massage Envy, and to, you pay $60 a month, and you get one massage. And, of course, I can have a massage, two massages a week. <laughs> And then I was saying to my husband, oh, and then I need to spend a $500 a month on my massages. And, um, and anyway, he was like, well, well, you should tell me, do you need your back rubbed? It was like, oh, no, I need a professional. <laughs> Partners are really bad at the massage. It's kind of like, is that okay? I'm done. They're really. Yes, no, no, I need a professional. Like, this is not like, that's like saying, can I give you a haircut? I mean, like, no, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> So the massage chair. So it's I love that. And then you're in Costco. I love it so, so much. It will That's chill so back. So it good. will chill back like a clam or like a big sort of vagina with its labial folds. And then it'll do an anti-gravity thing. And it'll do your butt. Oh, wow. It'll, you know? Because that's where, where, do you have pain in your body? Mine is my back. I always want my back. Yeah. I would, you know, well, I'll swim in your pool and you can come over and get in. Oh my God, COVID. We could, we'd have a very happy life together. <laughs> we could forget the man. Um. Oh. Okay. Now, wait. What did I write down? Oh my God. Okay. I just have to read something back to you that I like, just as an example of how what a good writer you are. Um. From the most, the last chapter about your dad's funeral, and your dad. Really, I was very choked up by it, and I love that there was the picture of him. And then the song and all everything. Um, oh, the guy who came to get your dad's body. <sighs> okay, so the dude looks, I'm just reading now. Um, this dude looks a little Irish or a little Scottish, which is unusual for Los Angeles's Palmdale desert area. Ready in complexion with elaborately combed, lightly brill creamed hair, both full and thinning. Great. You know, you know exactly what that means. In that LAX town car driver way. That is such a quintessential Sandra Singlow sentence. Like, you're just, oh, you're such a master of your craft. Oh. Um, that is I just really love that chapter. And I just thought, and that's just like one sentence. The whole book is filled with those kinds of sentences that are really, it's inspiring to me as a writer to be better. Oh my God, that is such a, that is such a nice thing to say. And, but there is so much LA town car of our life that is there's an LA town car guy and sometimes there are saviors and sometimes they're so oh, no. much nicer than they need to be in that right moment. oh my god to me people who you know aren't earning very much money who are nicer than they need to be is like a constant breaking of my heart poignant thing that I can barely get over yeah and the, the Lyft and Uber drivers that occasionally you'll have the most astonishing oh, conversation yeah. with somebody you know and that's where so much of our lives sit in there, in those in-between places. I know it. And actually, you know, they say people who, like my husband will never have any, like I'm always having conversations with these people and he's like, why do you do that? I would never have any conversation with any person like that at all. 
but as I pointed out to him, you can look at the science. People who make small connections like that in their day with just random people who are, my, you know, it's a great source of happiness and connection, you know? And I think that's what people are really suffering from now. It, I think in a way, it isn't the close friendships in a way. It's the small people you don't know at all that you're just at the dry cleaner and you're saying this or you're noticing that or you happen to say this. Those are the things that seem to have a toll, emotional toll, even more than the close relationships, many of which is kind of a relief not to have to be part of. <laughs> Just when you said that, though, I kind of felt really teary because I think with our close relationships, they've almost become like too close. Like I'm right. zooming with my family, like all that, right, like it's right. kind of like, I really, so it, it, it's, it's so intense what people are, and we're, I'm having like hour long weekly zoom calls with people who i just really didn't even hang out that much with before but right. yeah little connections little uh, connections between people and and that we didn't even realize there was that i mean like like i love grocery checkers that go um you know there you kind of like like often in van nuys you kind of an older kind of white lady little right. weather beaten skin maybe has smoked a few too many years and kind of like when the groceries come along and say what are we having for dinner tonight? Or can you buy like a couple bottles of wine, like maybe more than you should for the week? It's like, I'm coming to your house tonight. I mean, right, exactly. I know. <laughs> By the way, now we just go to Costco and buy cases of wine. <laughs> Actually, we ran into this woman, this wonderful woman who runs the Groundling Theater that I really love and would love to be friends with. And we ran into her and her two little kids at Costco, and she looked down at our car. <laughs> there was so much alcohol. It was like, we're opening a bar. Like, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, I think it was three cases of wine, three cases of beer, like a whole bunch of bourbon. Like, we were just like, hi. <laughs> I guess you can see how we're planning to deal with the quarantine. <laughs> right before the quarantine. And as soon as I heard about the quarantine, I said to Michael, we have to go to Costco. We have to go to Costco and get wine. We've got to get cases of wine. Well, and, and I think that's been part of this pandemic thing that even though kind of like our legacy media and our social media has come up with really inspiring things to do and like paint, read, meditate here are 100 classic movies to watch you know they don't say the best porn of 2019 which might be helpful to some people like that. classic movies reach out and touch a senior etc cetera, etc cetera. but in fact there's so many people who are self-medicating and it's kind of like either there is i think day drinking there is so oh, much definitely do <laughs> we don't even call that self-medicating <laughs> <laughs> we There's just like, that it's lunch yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> or there is i a writer friend i won't say who but it's like sent me a photo of cannabis edible packets that are so a pile of them oh, and uh -huh. separating them and dividing them so that the trash guy wouldn't get scared of how many <laughs> and then there's the stress gaining of 30 pounds the trainers like gained 30 pounds and mostly oreos there's been a whole i heard about this whole oreo run in los angeles that there was oh, a, like wow. a lawyer dad who went back to his office building on wilshire illicitly to go to the vending machines and get the oreos okay my secret thing is that when I get gas in the car, which we don't go anywhere. So that's only been like twice since the <laughs> pandemic started. Um, I go buy red vines. <laughs> and I hide them in my office. <laughs> and then if things are stressful, I know I can go to my office and have a red vine. <laughs> I've been, I think the sourdough baguette, because I really shouldn't have bread. And I just, so you know it's it's no, just I, okay this is what i'm not kidding i know i was on a fast last time we saw each other in person but um i'm really into there's no bad foods and there's no anything you just eat what you want really just eat what you want because can i just say i know i'm bringing us back to the food now that it's been so it's now may and we saw each other in january so after january 10th i never monitored my food in any way in any way now, I think I have gained some weight. I haven't gotten on the scale. I think I have gained some, 
but not a ton. And the stress, the lack of stress on my life for eating is so huge. It's so big. I wish I had just done this when I was 25. Like, I, so don't, I don't like you saying the bread's bad. Nothing's bad. Okay, no, it's not bad. It's, it's not bad. But I'm kind of going through a thing where I can't really exercise very much. I do, I just did some online yoga where I lie there and just yes. hold a pillow and cry. And then I can't really walk. I'm not really a good walker or runner. Calories. A lot of crying does burn. Yeah, out. a lot of crying. But then I noticed one, I'm going to try to act up like, so I'm sitting in my media nest, couch, bed, whatever, waiting for the Andrew Cuomo thing to load from CNN, which is my version of cardio, is like right. watching him. And as I'm sitting there, I can like, like, it's like my, okay, I'm gonna show, my t-shirt had started, oh my God, is there a rash? Okay, this is, had gone like this. So it's a formerly loose t-shirt that all my t-shirts are going like this, and I have like a shelf belly that is that is just kind of like a new thing that I go into the shower and I have to hold it up with two hands. <laughs> so it, it's just because it was so weirdly swollen. So that kind of thing, if I can just, that's why I'm wearing these pants, if I could just get around the- Okay, the, well, but I vote for just let it go. Just eat what you want, do what you want. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think I'm basically with you on that because what's the point otherwise? And and so it's so, much, it's so much trauma and stress for really such a little result. Like what in the end? Maybe you'll be five pounds thinner. You know? I mean, fuck it. I yeah. Know, I say that on the LA yeah. library thing, yeah. but we're not on Baywatch, so. But I wonder. I'll be. I'm. I'm actually excited for all the coronavirus literature and movies that are going to come out after this because i don't like i wonder because people are saying there's going to be a lot more divorces but then maybe a lot more marriages you know like it seems like it'll be interesting to see like i want to read the stories of how, the bad you know how bad it is like, or how good it is you know like or how like i have to imagine some people thought they were probably about to get divorced or split up or whatever their situation is and then they're quarantined and they realize you know what they actually really like that person or you know like there's got to be good there's i'm sure there's all every story you can have i think it probably depends what of as i call these four apocalypse selves you turned out to be like you know you're you're the farmer so you have projects or you're the warrior and so i notice in my middle age and my sort of menopause i'm i get more sensitive to smells and sound so if I'm sitting in the morning having coffee and my partner is rattling the New York Times and go, oh, like <laughs> makes like some exhalation about what like I, I just kind of sound to do. And so he thinks I'm just overreactive of kind of like there's always some music playing somewhere. And it's just yeah. like, so I think I've just become that, yeah, let me say post cohab that person to go to another room because i definitely don't like eating sounds of my family <laughs> there no i have this thing where i think it's a thing though i looked it up on the internet like it is a thing it's not you know some people it's like after i've known somebody for like three years especially if i'm living with them it's like a microphone gets installed inside their mouth yes the they eat it is the loudest thing it's like we can't even talk by how loud it is that you're eating and I'm sure they feel the same about me. I mean, I don't know. But to me, it's inc it's sort of like, oh, my God. And I just have to get up and go. Like, I just have to go to a different room. Is there a name for that? Of um, yeah, it, there's a, you know, when I first, um, God, I can't remember when I first heard about it. Um, but yeah, there is, I, I don't know how, no, I don't know what the name is. I think there is a name for it. But that's exactly what happens. So sensitive to sounds and like uh, just reading the right. oh, it's just oh, you know, it's kind of like yeah, yeah. So it was, and and also I realized you know part of the the weight gain part of this has been me because I always kept be thought I was going to be a better person. Like it's like I was good. I went to the gym today. Now going to the gym sounds like going to Magic Mountain and being on crack. Right. It sounds so exciting. Even getting the parking ticket stamped with its click just sounds eh, so amazing. So then I go, I think I'm going to go to the Rose Bowl Loop today. And then that was closed. Um, I think I'm going to go to oh, the yeah. park and do, what are they called, calisthenics. 
Yes, I will. And then the park closed. So you couldn't do anything, but the essential place was the grocery store. Right. And for many of us, it's really not that essential because we already have a pantry full of stuff. No, I know. It's hard not to go to the grocery store a lot. Because it because it's exciting and just yeah, thinking about the peppers that sound it's like going to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It's so exciting to see those colors. Fact, we were trying to just go once a week, and um, then we 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 got to like we you go you get everything, but you don't get some small thing that you know is at Whole Foods or you know I want to get the Trader Joe's frozen corn because I know I like that. And Mike Mulan said the other night, you and Dad go to grocery stores like you're going clubbing. You know, we went to Whole Foods, but then we thought, let's go to Trader Joe's. And then we came out and said, but Ralph's has that bread. I'm like, she goes, what are you doing? What are you doing? I was like, because it's very exciting. It's so it's exciting. exciting. And then I, I go to the yuppie store in the nice part of town because they have a butcher count. Like, it's like, yes, it's so exciting. You put the gloves and the mask. And Julia, to be honest, is kind of like, I at some point was so depressed in this whole time that I was driving in the car and listening to the radio and say, well, jobs are down across the board, but grocery stores are hiring. So I go, I actually went online, actually Stater Brothers is the beautiful grocery store here, and looked for a job at Stater Brothers. Okay, okay. in your book, where you talk about Charlie look, uh, and the Trader Joe's job. Okay, <laughs> oh, here we go. I was like, I could still work at Trader Joe's, in fact, why don't I work at Trader Joe's? And then my husband said, oh, you would work at Trader Joe's for a week and you wouldn't be, like it. I go, really? I think I would like it. <laughs> I actually totally, and in fact, I think one of the sad parts of being successful enough not to look for a job like that, which is not a bad job. I'm not even saying that. That's not a bad job. But I, the, uh, being a writer, you know, it's different. Okay. But I think it's one of the tragedies of my life that I don't have to work a job like that because I want to. And first of all, I would be good at it. I'm a, I'm a, I would say, hey, oh boy, I wish I was in your house tonight. <laughs> I would say all that stuff. And sometimes I go too far and get a bad look. But, you know, and I would like it. And I, I, I actually, just saying that makes me, because I feel like I am really like that kind of interaction that a store gives, because you know it can't go on too long. It, they, it's, it's anonymous, which makes it intimate in a very specific way. You're seeing humanity coming through. Like, I would, I'm, I'm getting off this thing and I'm looking for a job at Trader Joe's, because I think it does sound... And it's a happy you place. Exercise. You could fill the shelves. No, you have to be able to lift stuff, especially in the meat counter, like 80 pounds in a cold environment. And then there's the bagging groceries and breaking down and then the I returning of carts. I don't know about the returning of carts. That part, I, that's true. I, I, I wouldn't love that so much, but everything else. And I, I remember it is true that in our writer's lives and yeah. you act so much, the writer's life is kind of, you do sit home all the time and there's a lot of mentation in your head. And I remember actually really some of the happiest parts of my life, which when I had an office job, three days a week, nine to two, that just covered, I was alone in office and it just covered basically my rent and stuff. And I'd pick up the phone and Beverly, I, I worked for Beverly Kay. And I'd go, Beverly Kay and Associates. I get in. And it was so happy because I could make people happy. I could fax, I could type, and it was, it's a structure. Hello, I know, it's been a tough day. How are you? Yeah. Oh no, Dr. Richard is not in right now, um, but he'll be back next week, shall I? You know, I just, I did really- yes, you had the, But you know what is making me think this conversation? Cause I, my friend, Wendy Goldman, who now lives in New York, but she used to have a friend who owned a bookstore in, I think Sherman Oaks or something. And she would go, Sometimes she'd work on Saturdays. Like she totally didn't need to do it, but she'd go in on Saturday from 10 to six and just recommend books and walk around. She just learned the cash register. And I thought, oh my God, I wish I had someone I knew where I once a week, you know, when this lifts somewhat or whatever, where I can, because in some ways the, this has made me realize how much I like being alone, but it's also made me realize what type of not being alone I like most. And I would say being working somewhere like a Trader Joe's or a bookstore or something like that, where you're doing quick interaction with anonymous people is just the kind of interacting I want. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it, it is. There's something that we didn't realize, like you said, how we missed it until we missed it. And I think the other kind of frustrating thing of this weird time and the wake in something is not being quarantined at home and not being able to do anything to help. Because I remember early on where I go, ah, they are making face masks in uh, New York, the emergency workers, out of office supplies. And I would go, ding, that's my purpose. I'm going to go to Staples, right. I'm buy office supplies, and I'm going to make masks somehow, even though I'm very farsighted, I have poor motor skills, I don't know how to make a mask, I will remove all the office supplies I need and make a mask that doesn't work with my sweaty, infected hands. So it's kind of like with the quarantine, it's called, like, that's a frustrating thing, aside from not being able to interact with people, not being able to be... To help, I know. Right, and, and so then... Like that. Right? I, yeah, because this, the other thing, because I went through that too, because I always thought, my husband was always saying, if things get bad, we have to have, like, he wants me to get my Irish citizenship because my grandparents are Irish, which I saw I'm eligible, if we have to get out of the States. And I'd be like, no, because I'm staying and fighting. I'm going to be there on the front line. I'm, I'm not the kind of person who's going, oh, I'm going to New Zealand. I'm going to be there. But then he, this thing happens, and they're saying, just stay home. Just stay home. Just don't go out. So it's like, the best thing I can do is not go out. And then, because I'm 60, um, I suddenly, and I was thinking to myself, as I'm totally healthy, even though I've had cancer and I'm overweight and pre-diabetic and everything else, <laughs> I have this idea that I'm this healthy person that could take on anything. And it occurred to me in a very scary way that I'm not. And that actually, I don't know how I'd react to getting this. And that I really am too afraid. Because I was like, I'm going to go volunteer at the hospital. I'm going to go in and check people in and you know, whatever. And um, yeah, it's very, feels very impotent. It does. And I remember even when California was going to have its surge a couple of weeks ago, like we were talking to, they say, well, don't even go to the grocery store this week. And my partner was like going, so, but if it's a surge, are people going to the emergency room? Why would they be at Ralph's? And then I'm thinking, well, maybe because of the cumbersome mask and gloves, it's because we're going to bang the cart against our toe dislocate our toe well, and then have to go to the emergency that room. That is true. So that even if you stay home, drink rosé all day and watch The Walking Dead, you still walking to your bathroom might stub your toe. Right. But there's a lot of toe stuff. Like, you know, so, that, so it's like just become a giant larva and just don't move. And that is a very hard thing to maintain, to not get in well, the way. not for me. Actually, I've really embraced it. <laughs> But you're still hiking. Aren't you just hiking and walking at five in the morning? No, because they closed the hiking trails at Griffith Park. Okay. And then they just opened them up. But I just now I developed I I go in every morning to the pool for 30 minutes. And I have a time, I have a clock that is an indoor outdoor clock that I can see. And I do my routine. I have a 30 minute routine. And then I do it again at night at about nine o'clock at night. That's amazing. And so to me that ends up being an hour of activity. And, um, and I do underwater dancing. I have my music and I dance and I <laughs> myself because no one will get in with me <laughs> and I do it. And I feel like now I really don't have to leave the house. So I'm okay. I can live here. I can be here except for my one day a week. I want to work at the bookstore. So on the theme of dancing though, since it's kind of like, so I, I, I love your dancing in your pool anyway. And I would like to say you know, this is a time of our lives, even though we're in quarantine, to be able to celebrate the age we are and who we are, no apologies, yes. and have it be fun. Oh, yes, and I swim naked. I feel like water <laughs> come out of her room because she doesn't want to see me in the pool naked. <laughs> it is, I think that would be shocking to see your yep. mother that way, dancing naked. Um, oh, my God, but Sandra, I hope everyone buys your book because it's so good and it's so thoughtful and insightful and you're really a wonderful writer and I want you to just keep writing. I want, I'm just want to make sure that you're writing during this quarantine, everything that you're saying and thinking. Um, I am. And I think with this, yes. And I hope that for everybody, it's going to be a summer of reading because we, yeah. something that we can do. I think I new books that, that are coming out that really helps authors who are crying in their like to get the books that are out also, to turn to old books that have come out, some of them come out, came out after September 11th, like a friend of mine had a novel that, like, to rediscover all the books that we 
um, have. Oh, yeah. Yesterday, I just got the short stories of Hemingway, which I've never really read. I've only read like the novels, but. So I I'm got. I should do the short stories of Hemingway. I, and the short stories of Deborah Eisenberg, who's the, married to Wallace Shawn a long time ago. Her first short story was called Days. Oh, and yeah. it was never published. And it's so funny. It's about her quitting smoking and falling apart and just going running at the gym. And it's very hilarious. And it's like a quarantine story. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think, you know, reading about stuff that's happening now that may happen in the future, that happened in the past, and certainly the world of my book, where I'm going, really, one of the problems with the Buffalo Wild Wings was so complicated. The ADHD that we had of kind of like, there are 30 to 7 kinds of wings and 40 kinds of jalapeno spread. And then the, the, the waiters are in referee shirts and bells are going off and you're playing a trivia game on an iPad. Or that I remember like Ariana Huffington would uh, tell us about this new thing she had discovered called sleep. Oh, yes, I love that chapter. <laughs> yeah, like, these were the high-class problems that we used to, to have. It's like, why is Ariana having to sleep like a rock star? She doesn't. Like, she, I could tell her how to sleep 14 hours. So, yeah, so it's like, I don't know, it's for us all to ruminate the summer and read books, whoever writes them, and whatever books they are. Yes. And you have some books that people could get also. Oh, Like, yes. God said, ha, I have them. Um. That's right. I yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. People don't need to get them, um, <laughs> but they could if they wished. Um, I would say if it's not one thing, it's your mother. That's the last one, and that's I'm probably most proud of that one. I always think I'm a better talker than I am a writer. I but think you that's... are a great writer, Sandra. You really are a great writer. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, we yeah, hope you should have heard my husband the whole time I was rereading it the last two days. I was like, I'm so inspired by this. I'm so inspired by her descriptions. I would just write down different descriptions. Just, oh my God. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. I really um, appreciate that. It's a pleasure to write, a pleasure to be read, and a pleasure to talk to you. I know this was fun. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks to both of you. Um, a reminder, Sandra's new book is The Mad Woman and the Roomba, My Year of Domestic Mayhem. It is available wherever books are sold, and we encourage you to support the authors we feature and independent bookstores by buying their books at bookshop.org. You can also purchase a signed copy in the link in the comments below.